Thank you. Again, I'm Michael Nealon. I'm here on behalf of Eli Lilly. And today I'm happy to be able to share what we've learned working with Dean Nexus. We started working with Dean Nexus uh, about a year ago. And today I want to talk about how we're building reproducible and portable pipelines by using open standards and technologies. So at, the, uh, sorry, at Lilly, I work in the Research Data Sciences and Engineering Group, and we work with uh, a few therapeutic areas. At Lilly, there are multiple therapeutic areas and global regions. And in the past, historically, these groups would develop pipelines as they needed them with the infrastructure available to them. And this would uh, cause challenges to, in being able to work across these regions or with different infrastructure. And um, just to give an idea of the size of the data that we're working with, we took an inventory of the data that the groups I work with uh, have, and there's about 1.2 petabytes on our file system. And that's just some of the data. And there are more data types than that, and it all just keeps growing. So that kind of data growth and the need to work uh, globally in, in multiple locations really drives the need for a IT supported and more methodical kind of approach to omics pipelines. And that's when we began our engagement with Dean and Nexus. Um, in addition, our on-prem infrastructure is not growing exponentially like the data. So we also need that on-demand compute in the cloud, which Dean and Nexus helps with as well. So our first pipeline that we ported onto Dean and Nexus, we got a two times speed up uh, just by getting that on-demand compute and that consistent compute environment. The first pipeline that we did work on that we focused on was our DNA sequencing pipeline, our whole exome sequencing pipeline. And the reason we chose this one at first is because it needed a lot of upgrades. There was a lot of thought and research by our scientists put into what kind of new collars and tools they wanted to add to it. And it also had not been updated as recently as some of the other pipelines. It was actually written over the course of about eight years with multiple individuals involved. And the underlying infrastructure actually changed during that time. There is a different cluster scheduler uh, now than when it was originally written. So there's a lot of legacy artifacts in there. There's hard-coded references to uh, data and resource requirements. And it's just very entangled with the uh, infrastructure that it runs on. So it's difficult for it to be run anywhere else. Uh, one example is that we have a group in China that wanted to run this pipeline and it was impossible for them to get it running on their cluster. So they actually started working with Dean Nexus uh, before my group a few years ago, but they were mostly using off-the-shelf pipelines, whereas, uh, like I mentioned, our scientists were making custom requests and want to constantly update and change things, so we needed a more sustainable solution to be able to support that kind of custom development. The other aspect of a, of a custom pipeline like this is that there was no concept of failure recovery. So Anytime you do want to make a change, it required restarting from the beginning if it failed. So making a small modification might take a few weeks because you had to wait for it to fail and then start back to do some trial and error. So before we wanted to implement any of the new requested features, we really needed to update the framework that we were building these pipelines on to be able to do that. So upgrading and moving into the cloud gave us this opportunity to kind of rethink this architecture around how we build these pipelines and not just do a, a port, a lift and shift. So we have some requirements when we're moving these pipelines. And when we first started working on this, we actually weren't clear about some of these right away. Uh, these kind of developed over time. Looking back, I can see that these are what was important to us. And when we first started working with DNA Nexus, we actually were using the native DNA Nexus APIs. And that only got us so far before we realized it wasn't going to satisfy all the requirements that we now know. And at one point, um, let's see, the workflow. Language. So some of these requirements were that we actually, we had, we had this running on-prem already. This was already running, and uh, we wanted to be able to keep running it on-prem. So we don't want to take a step back and have this transition gap where we're not able to run anything. The other thing is that as an exercise in portability and to be able to test, we wanted a local development environment on our workstations. We wanted to be able to deploy the same pipeline on our computers. And we also, as our ultimate end goal, want to be able to deploy in the cloud to get our on-demand compute. 
So one option after we pass by the native APIs is that we considered building our own workflow language, which the idea there was maybe we could translate what we had that was already running, and we could run that how we were on-prem. There's no transition, no gap in time there, and then we could get it to run optimally in the cloud, but that's not something we wanted to maintain. So the other option in front of us that we discussed were open standards and software, and these include technologies that DNA Nexus already supports on the platform, so common workflow language and the workflow description language. And the decision to go this route wasn't immediate. We had a lot of conversations with DNA Nexus and the Broad on how they support these languages and uh, ways that they have been migrating pipelines uh, using these languages as well. So this required us, we, we hadn't seen a lot of examples of people deploying in multiple places with these, so it required us to proof out parts of it and deploy in these different environments. So it took some time before we settled on using these kinds of standards and uh, defining what this architecture looks like. But now we are using these open standards and technologies, and this is the general pattern that we're using. So this is a pretty high-level overview, but I'm hoping that if anyone's starting in the same place we did about a year ago, this can help you get started as well. So one thing you'll notice right away is that we settled on the workflow description language, Whittle, and that's great for us because we're able to separate a lot of things. You can focus on tasks, compose them into workflows, and you can separate your concerns uh, as long as you strongly define the interfaces between them. We're able to make this reproducible by uh, utilizing Linux containers. Uh, so when we run that on DNA Nexus and our workstations, that's using Docker. When we run it on our grid engine, our HPC cluster, we use Singularity. When we submit to DNA Nexus, uh, we're using DX Whittle to translate these Whittle tasks and workflows into native DNA Nexus tasks and workflows, or apps and workflows. When we submit to Grid Engine and our workstations, we utilize Cromwell. And on Grid Engine, that requires using a configuration that tells it how to convert our Docker image into a singularity image, and then also how to convert those resource requests and tasks into Grid Engine submission scripts. One thing to be aware of if you're trying to run in multiple places like this is that you do get a reproducible environment through the Linux container, but your computational environment that you're running on isn't the same. So one interesting thing that we ran into and learned the hard way was that when we submit to our Grid Engine cluster, a resource request is respected as a maximum request. When you submit it to DNA Nexus, it's a minimum request. So the other difference is you get a whole machine, a single tenant machine on DNA Nexus, and on our cluster, you're sharing that node. So if you exceed that request, your job actually gets killed. So in order to be able to prevent that from being killed and be able to use the same code base, you might be underutilizing on DNA Nexus because you might get more resources than you've requested, but you're setting that as your maximum. So that's just one part to be aware of. That's a difference when you're deploying in multiple places. Another one are the actual inputs when you're submitting these. Cromwell and DX will actually take a different JSON input format. And in addition to that, file types are different. When you look at Cromwell, you have paths or URIs. With DNA Nexus, they're file IDs. And then with these pipelines, we parameterize all our inputs. We don't hard code any of these assumptions anymore within the code. So there's many inputs. And when you're having to have different sets of inputs for the same type of data, this files for both DNA Nexus and uh, Cromwell, and then you might have multiple different profiles, say if it's a different organism, that adds a lot of combinations of these input parameters, and then again, it's a different input format for DNA Nexus and Cromwell. So that adds some complexity when you have many profiles, and to help resolve and manage some of that, we've been using uh, configuration management software, so we've been utilizing Ansible to template and generate these JSON inputs. So there was a lot of effort to basically rewrite everything to get it running in this kind of architecture, even with the same functionality initially. But it's given us a lot of benefits. The list on the left isn't characteristic of every pipeline we have at Lily, just this one that needed the most attention initially. So now we're able to focus on core functionality and kind of abstract and separate concerns. Uh, 
And now all of our uh, tasks and workflows have everything parameterized, nothing's hard coded or assumed. We get all the resources we need on demand and we dynamically allocate how, many, how much of the resources we need instead of uh, having these ups and downs in a cluster. And then we also have a lot of confidence in what we're building because we are using test driven development and we have these portable runtimes that we're able to reproducibly deploy everywhere. So to be able to test these, that was one of the things is that a lot of these tools were still, even now, they're still pretty new. When we first started using Whittle, it was actually in draft two still. Uh, there wasn't full 1.0 support for Whittle on both Chrome and DNA Nexus until a few months ago. So one gap that um, we needed to close to be able to bring this into an enterprise environment was for testing. We didn't see a lot of examples out there on how to thoroughly test these in a very methodical way. So when we first started testing, we would write the tasks and we would copy the command block into a test script that we would execute against the Docker container. And that would give us some coverage, but we really needed to test the whole execution. There are some tools that could help, like WAM Tool Validate, that can tell you part of the story about whether or not things are gonna run, but we really needed to execute these with a Whittle execution engine. So we wrote a plugin uh, in collaboration with the Nexus. So this is one of our key outcomes of that engagement. And this plugin is a PyTest plugin that allows you to execute your Whittle task with defined input parameters and outputs and asserts the execution's outputs to tell if you're getting exactly what you expect. So this is a package that I'm happy to announce that we've open sourced so that everyone can benefit from it. And I wanna thank John Didion from Dean and Nexus who was the major contributor on this. And I'm really hoping to see a lot of uh, community uptake in this because right now we're using Cromwell as our runner, but I'm hoping in the future we're gonna see DNA Nexus runners for these tests and mini Whittle and hopefully a lot more augmentation on that. And if anyone's interested in learning how to use this or seeing it in depth, there will be a workshop tomorrow that goes over Whittle best practices and it's gonna dive a little bit into detail on how to use this framework as well. So after moving everything into this architecture, we were able to start seeing uh, immediate benefits. So this DNA seq pipeline was the first one we uh, ported over. And uh, the first release we did of that was basically taking the same functionality into this new architecture. And we immediately saw just from the consistent compute environment and on demand compute, we saw about a two time speed up. Uh, the other thing you'll notice is that when we did run this on prem, we would sometimes have to wait in the queue, or if we had to restart, it would go to the beginning, and you get huge variability in the turnaround time on that, whereas in the cloud, it's a really consistent experience. So that, that's something that was a huge benefit, just moving into the cloud, but the new pattern and architecture allowed us to start tackling all those new requests and requirements we have from our scientists to start adding new features. So now that we were using Whittle and we had test-driven development, all of our developers were able to work in parallel, independently on these tasks, and all they had to concern themselves as communication was that their interfaces between them were strongly defined. And we were able to test these and get a lot of confidence in the reproducibility across all these systems. <laughs> 